Thank you for joining us today for Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our webinar Wednesday program. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They're recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds or hosts over 300 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so if you have questions for our speaker, we will have her information on the last slide of the presentation today. A special thanks to our educational sponsor, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, for making these webinars possible. The NBSBC is the largest nonprofit trade association for veterans. Please visit their website for more information. And now a little bit about us. We work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. More information is on our website. We will also be hosting a webinar today on government quarter four opportunities today at 1 p.m. There is still time to register on our website. And we also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach more than 19,800 subscribers. This includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pressing information with the email shown on your screen. Now to introduce our speaker, Devin Hewitt. Welcome, Devin. We're glad to have you here with us today. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the perspective of this particular webinar is my perspective. And I am a protest lawyer. I have participated in over 200 protests. Uh, including at the agency level, at the Small Business Administration, at the Federal Aviation Administrator Administration, um, the majority at the Government Accountability Office, and I've also done protests at the United States Court of Federal Claims. And obviously, all these protests uh, challenge a, an agency's evaluation of proposals. And in the course of participating and defending or prosecuting a protest, I have the opportunity to re um, review all types of proposals, technical proposals, business proposals, price, cost proposals, et cetera. Um, given in my 30-year career, I've done a wide variety of protests. So I've seen, uh, I think, probably the whole gamut of proposals that are submitted to the government. And many issues come up in these protests regarding the proposal drafting or proposal interpretation or submission of proposal um, activities uh, that occur during a procurement. And I think that uh, this case law or the issues um, that are that come up in these protests uh, are instructive uh, for those who are writing proposals or are responsible for producing and submitting proposals to the government. So I'm going to share with you some lessons learned um, that I've uh, witnessed during the pro uh, protest process and sort of give you that perspective uh, on these proposal writing, drafting, and submission issues. Next slide. Now, obviously, the proposal preparation process starts with the solicitation. Uh, that is the primary communication from the government of its needs, um, how it wants proposals uh, drafted, submitted, and the manner in which the agency will evaluate proposals. So that is the point of reference and the most important document for information regarding the proposal process. I think the the one um, the one lesson learned is that the solicitation means what it says. I think particularly for incumbents, there is a lot of reading between the lines, and uh, many incumbents have other information either from direct sources within the agency or rumors, et cetera. And those messages or information they have collected, sometimes is inconsistent or uh, is used to fill in certain blanks in the solicitation. And I counsel pro, um, contractors from doing that because the solicitation means what it says. What is um, listed or identified as the agency's needs in the solicitation is the benchmark against which the proposal will be evaluated 
And so any departure from that based on rumor or, or inside knowledge, et cetera, uh, puts the proposal at, at great risk and your chances of winning at great risk. Now, more often than not, of course, uh, the solicitation is unclear or there are provisions that are inconsistent. And my advice there is always, always ask a question because not only may you get a, hel a helpful answer and actually probably most of the time you won't, but there is a purpose, a legal purpose for doing so. If you raise a question uh, regarding a solicitation before you submit a proposal and the govern gives, government gives you a response or even if it's a non-response, then the agency has the burden after award to demonstrate that its interpretation during the evaluation was reasonable. More importantly, if it's obvious in the solicitation that there is an inconsistency or some lack of clarity, that's considered in the law as something called a patent ambiguity or patent ambiguity ambiguity and the contractor has the responsibility to raise that issue otherwise it will be bound by the government's reasonable interpretation now if something is a latent ambiguity and that means an ambiguity that is not evident from the face of the solicitation but later arises during the evaluation then there will be a different standard of review i think the most important thing is to remember is that if you see something that doesn't look right in the solicitation or is inconsistent, then really the burden is on the contractor to raise it and you put, again, yourself, the, the proposal at risk for failing to do so. Another issue that often comes up is that the agency responds either to an individual question or an email and a contractor interprets that as guidance, but from a legal perspective, an agency's response to a question is not binding on the government unless it is officially incorporated into the solicitation per an amendment. So even if you get a written document that responds or an independent document that's taught, you know, that's labeled Q's and A's, what's said in that document will not be binding on the government unless it is specifically attached or incorporated into an amendment. Now, if the response you get from the agency is inadequate or insufficient, and again, um, is really critical to the way you approach a proposal, consider protesting the solicitation uh, requirement or the lack of clarity, et cetera. Um, and then that might force the agency to clarify or amend the solicitation to make it um, more in concert with what its intention was. But in this regard, it's important to remember that you have to make this protest at either the agency or another forum uh, before the due date announced for submission of the proposals. If it turns out after award that you have an issue with something um, regarding the way the agency interpreted a solicitation requirement and that a consistency was obvious, again, patent at the time the solicitation came out. If you didn't file a protest regarding that inconsistency um, before the solicitation due date, you um, have waived your ability to raise it after contract award. Next slide. Now it should be axiomatic that when you prepare your proposal that you follow the instructions contained in a section L. Section L of the solicitation contains um, instructions and section M of the solicitation contains the evaluation factors against which your proposal will be evaluated. GAO, which is the, the primary forum for consideration or protest, strictly enforces restrictions on what other people would call technicalities, things like page limits, font size, date and time of submission, or the place and manner of delivery. These things are 
important, even though they seem to be minor details and don't go to the quality or content of a proposal. But these things matter. And something simply is doing a proposal in the wrong font will um, be a cause for elimination of your proposal from the competition. Often in preparing proposals, there are assumptions that are made by a contractor that create a context in which the proposal offer is um, submitted or raised with the government. But a contractor needs to be careful because some solicitations require a contractor to explicitly state that they are not making an assumption or taking exception to some issue in the solicitation provisions. Other than that, if you are going to include uh, assumptions or exceptions or clarifications, those should be expressly set out in the, um, in the proposal. Now, keep in mind that in a protest context, this might be fodder for a disappointed offeror in a protest because they might say that the solicit that the proposal is making a departure from what the solicitation requires. But that all depends in, on, on the nature of the, the proposal, the procurement, and how it is drafted. So you need to be very careful in this section or in this um, issue uh, and how you address it in your proposal. Of course, hopefully everybody knows that there should be a confidentiality or restricted use legend on the cover page of every proposal and often in the bottom margin of every page of the proposal uh, advising the government that the information is confidential and proprietary in the proposal and that it should not be released outside the government. Um, next slide. Now, with regard to proposal submission, there is a, a term, late is late. There really is no gray area here. So not only does the proposal need to be submitted on time, the offeror has the burden of demonstrating not only that the proposal was delivered, but also that it was received by the particular agency point of contact. So if it's hand delivered, that means the individual and, and the best way to ensure that of course is get them to sign um, something saying that they've received the proposal. I think this is not really done very much anymore, but in the event it is in a special case, make sure that the particular individual that is identified in the solicitation as the point of contact acknowledges receipt of the proposal. If it's transmitted electronically, it must be received at the email address identified in the solicitation. And if it's uploaded, it must be uploaded to the particular portal that's identified in the solicitation. And I've actually participated in a number of these protests where, for example, a proposal is transmitted electronically, but it gets hung up in an agency firewall. And in that event, even though it gets hung up and ultimately reaches the um, email address to which it, it should was sent, if it reaches it beyond the due date, then the agency doesn't require you to, um, doesn't require, is not required to evaluate the proposal. So what should be done in that case is to try to confirm receipt of the proposal electronically, obviously to try to, when you, when you send your um, email to make sure that it, um, you know, it has an acknowledged receipt, maybe an acknowledged read if the, if the person who receives it will allow that to happen. Um, you should also, um, you know, attempt to call maybe an agency contact to make sure that they have received it. Um, if it's uploaded, I've had uh, occasions where a contractor is submitted it to a particular portal, but also submits it to another portal, um, whether it's GSA eBuy or you know, direct email where we're supposed to go through eBuy, and that has been rejected as well. That proposal has been rejected as well. So these things are very important. Uh, also, 
you should test the size of the file that you sent. Of course, you know, again, if it gets rejected because the file is too large, then it will be considered not to have been received by the agency. Now, there is an exception to this late is late and the burden on the offeror to demonstrate that it's sent and, and that the proposal was received. And that is if an agency has mishandled the proposal. These cases actually were where there was a hand delivery and a contractor is only allowed or access to the mail room and then it gets lost in the mail room and doesn't reach the actual contracting officer point of contact. Uh, these cases have been used and I myself have used them as the basis to talk about when an agency's firewall or there's some other you know, computer failure to deliver the, um, the proposal to the exact electronic address. But unfortunately, GAO is not very persuaded by that, saying again that the offeror bears the risk and you know, should make sure that it does it early enough to be able to confirm delivery by the due date and, and time. Offerors also have a limited ability to correct mistakes in bids. Uh, this concept of mistakes generally arises in sealed bidding, where the government publicly opens a bid and the bid is, you know, pricing, and there may be a switch in digits or something that you know, it was obvious that the offeror didn't intend to pay 100,000, but rather 10,000, or offer to do the work for 10,000. Also, agencies can engage in quote unquote clarifications with offerors regarding certain things that are obvious in the proposal to the agency, such as a switching of a digit or some misidentification of an ACE code, et cetera. To the extent, though, that an agency allows an offeror to actually revise the proposal or submit additional information, that would, co that would constitute discussions, and the agency at that point would have to hold discussions with all the offerors, and if it fails to do so at that point, then it is committed a procurement error and a protest will be sustained on that basis. Next slide. So generally, the government evaluates proposals in, in, certain, in certain ways. The law is that they must evaluate the proposal in accordance with the evaluations, uh, evaluation factors included in the solicitation. So the formatting um, or the structure of the proposal should mirror that in some respects. Of course, you've got section L that probably says you have to have a technical proposal and a price proposal and then you know, these are the various evaluation topics, and that should mirror what the government is looking for and what it will evaluate. As a side note, the government may actually raise an issue or use an issue as a benchmark in an evaluation under a factor that actually may not be identified explicitly in the solicitation, but the government is, or the agency, is typically allowed to do that as long as as if the factor or sub factor is reasonably related to the overall large um, or you know, titled factor that you see in the solicitation. An agency may um, award on initial proposals received, but the solicitation has to say that. If it doesn't say that, then they're not allowed to do that. So of course, offerors shouldn't hold back in their first proposal submission, for example, in pricing, and then later anticipate that they would bring the price down because in fact, the agency may not give you that opportunity. So an offeror should not expect that an agency will enter into discussions. However, there is a DOD provision that says where a procurement's value is in excess of 100 million, the agency should engage in discussions. Now, interestingly, I am in a protest right now that is pending decisions where the agency did not engage in discussions and the procurement was in excess of 100 million. And the I'm on the side of defending the awardee at the agency. And we have said that where there are clear indicia in the evaluation that this is the appropriate best value awardee that 
that that particular provision does not prevent an agency from awarding um, without discussions. And uh, I'm not sure how that's gonna come out, actually. Another often um, cited language in a GAO protest is that an agency is not required to search all proposal sections in determining whether an offeror has addressed a particular requirement in a particular proposal section that was um, in the instructions. And often what happens is protesters say, well, you said that I um, didn't meet this requirement or this was a weakness in this particular section of the proposal, but I have addressed that in another area of the proposal or it's addressed in the price proposal. And GAO has often said, no, um, it's not on the burden of the government to scan through everything to see whether the requirements of one section is met um, by language in another section. So again, the proposal structure or the content really should mirror the evaluation factors and be consistent with the formatting instructions in section L. Next slide. Uh, related to the issue of clarifications versus discussions, if an agency engages in discussions, they're not required to hold uh, various rounds of discussions. And this is important for contractors to understand because often in response to discussions, uh, a contractor will submit new information in its uh, best and final offer or, or its revised proposal submissions. A good example is if during discussions and agencies um, advise the offeror that a particular resume does not comply with the requirements or they don't believe that that is a strong candidate, um, an offeror often will be in the will substitute a resume in the revised proposal submission. And if it turns out that that resume also is not compliant, at least from the government's point of view, the government has no duty to go back and question you regarding that resume. They can take a score that they may have found satisfactory after the initial uh, review of proposals and downgrade it based on something that is introduced in the revised proposal submission. So again, there has to be caution when certain aspects of the proposal are changed to introduce a new, um, new item or new information rather than a fuller explanation of information that had initially been in the proposal. Now, if the government does come back and engage in another round of dis discussions, they're not allowed to do that with only one offer or they have an obligation anytime they do discussions to do it with all offerors. This is not the requirement where they engage in clarifications. And the big difference between those is the government providing the offeror an opportunity to revise or amend the proposal. When that is done, despite what the agency calls it, those are discussions and those that opportunity has to be given to all offerors. When an agency starts to evaluate a proposal, they look at it in three tranches, if you will. They look to see whether or not the proposal meets or satisfies, satisfies the minimum requirements, whether they don't satisfy the minimum requirements or whether they exceed the agency's requirements. And what I find often with protesters or my clients who wanna protest is that they will claim that what they have proposed or what they've offered in a proposal is far more than what the agency asked for. But an agency is not required to recognize as an advantage every instance in which an offeror goes the extra mile. The agency has discretion to determine whether the, um, whether the extra mile, if you will, is beneficial to it. And if it is, quote unquote, advantageous to the government, it may um, give superior scores or points or colors to that offeror to the extent it has that view. But simply exceeding a requirement, um, you know, whether it's technical or pricing or uh, even past performance is not going to guarantee a, a better score or outcome in the evaluation. Next slide. 
Okay, with respect to the technical evaluation, you'll you'll see this language, you know, often in many solicitations. The solicitation will instruct an offeror to not parrot the solicitation requirements. And um, a terrible proposal is one that says in response to a government um, requirement that thou shall provide uh, mailroom support, a proposal that says we will provide mailroom support. The point of a technical, propo uh, a technical proposal is to describe the manner in which you, you, the offeror, will meet the agency's requirements. So it's not enough to say what you're going to do or that you will satisfy a requirement. Um, what really needs to be done is to describe for the agency how you will satisfy that requirement and hopefully what is innovative or superior about this approach. Now, in the olden days, when I used to do protests early on, there used to be this term called mandatory minimum minimum requirement. And it would there, that would be the phrase. And if an offeror failed to meet a mandatory minimum requirement, then the government was not allowed to award a proposal to that offeror or based on that proposal. The government shied away from this particular language, but often in Section L, you will see language where it states that you know, these requirements are need to be met or are mandatory and failure to meet them may result in the government excluding the proposal. So now you see may more than will or shall. So that does give the government discretion. That doesn't mean that an offeror is free to take exceptions or to depart from an agency requirement. We've already talked about caveats, exceptions, and, and assumptions earlier. But it does mean that in certain instances where certain um, evaluations are more subjective than not, that um, an agency may have discretion to accept a, an approach that not doesn't necessarily meet every detail of a requirement. And I, I wish I could give you some generalities about that. I think really was what is important from this perspective is to recognize that there are certain things that are requirements and other things that are approaches and alternate approaches and the importance of understanding when you are taking a departure, an exception, making a caveat, or doing an assumption. So part of this is to, to view everything as a requirement unless the solicitation states otherwise. Obviously, where the solicitation says shall, that is um, likely to be interpreted as a mandatory re uh, requirement. And in this regard, it's pretty consistent that with respect to things like education, experiences, licenses, or permits, or other sort of objective criteria, that GAO will strictly enforce those. That if you don't have that, if you don't have those, then um, the GAO will assume that that failure in your regard has prejudiced other offerors and, and there hasn't been a level playing field on which all the offerors have competed. On the other hand, there is case law where um, a protester is challenged that an agency has quote unquote waived a requirement. And the protester says, well, if they waived it for the awardee, they should have waived it for me, or they should have eliminated the award, eliminated the awardee from the competition because the awardee did not comply with this requirement. This case law is very counterintuitive because what GAO says in those instances is, well, the government's allowed to waive and you don't have the ability to protest unless you would have come out ahead if the waiver was applied to you. Um, so just the simple fact of a waiver is not enough you should demonstrate or have to demonstrate that the waiver had it been applied to you would have resulted in a superior score. And oftentimes the waiver doesn't necessarily apply 
because you have the license or the permit or the individual with the requirements. So your score depends on that and you can't show that if there's a waiver, you would have gotten a higher score. Often offer wars in order to ensure that the government acknowledges or understands that their proposal does meet all mandatory requirements. Offer wars often use a cross-reference table at the very beginning, I saw that a lot um, when I first started practice. I don't see it as much anymore, I think because of page limits and those sort of tables or cross-referencing tables are, I think for the most part, included within the page limit. So it, at that point in time, it's really not worth doing, but that puts the burden on making your proposal very clear, well-organized and um, specific with respect to how various portions of the proposal are addressing the various um, evaluation factors and requirements. Next slide. With respect to past performance evaluation, I think everybody knows that the references should demonstrate relevancy, but I will tell you that in certain protests, I've been successful in arguing relevancy in different ways. Uh, I think what's most common is that you show that a proposal is relevant because, um, or I'm sorry, a contract is relevant because the tasks that you performed under that past contract were similar to or you know identical to the tasks that you're going to be you are going to be required to perform under the instant contract. But relevancy could be shown in other ways. You could show that the prior contract has the same value the same number of personnel, uh, the same number of labor hours, whether it's the same agency or the work is follow on from incumbent work. Um, and the best way to address weaknesses in one aspect of a past performance reference is to play up the other issue. So for example, you may have a past performance reference that doesn't have all the tasks but you can highlight that while it may have three out of five, the value or the, um, the, the complexity of that contract outweighs the fact that you don't have experience on all the tasks. So I think you can be creative in that, in that way. And um, I have seen that be successful as a way to defend a contract award. Um, also, I use that affirmatively to show that while yes, they have all the statement of work tasks in this past performance reference, you know, it's a it's a contract for a million, whereas the particular requirements 500 million. The failure of contacts um, to return questionnaires does affect the ability of you to get a great score. So I think that that uh, means that a contractor always has to be obviously on good terms with their technical and contracting context in the agency um, and proactive in ensuring that they will be receptive or look, you know, look for these references and will be equally um, you know, proactive in you know, returning them. Another uh, protest count that comes often in a past performance context is that a protester will say, well, you gave it to these awardee but you know, there's been a investigation or they've been recently been suspended or there've been major problems on this contract. And yes, they may um, have good past performance in the various references they submitted, but you can't ignore what's right in front of you and what's happened in the last three months, et cetera. So the agency is required to consider information that is quote unquote, too close at hand for it to ignore. So that has got to be considered either from submitting or drafting a proposal or also from considering a, a protest of a awardee um, who supposedly has great past performance rankings or, or evaluation. Agencies also sometimes allow subcontractor past performance to factor in into the past performance evaluation but sometimes they don't. So I don't think that that assumption needs to be made. I think that, again, the solicitation says what it says. And often they will allow a major subcontractor, so subcontractors that are performing above a certain amount, 
you know, 40% of the work, they'll consider that particular subcontractor's past performance. But usually when they do consider subcontractor past performance, they will do so only to the extent that that past performance relates to the task for which the subcontractor will be responsible in performing the work. So just the, the fact that the subcontractor may have done uh, a really good job on certain statement of work tasks in the current solicitation is really not useful if the prime is going to have the responsibility for those tasks. I've been involved in protests also where there is a concern about using affiliates or sister companies. Um, often if there's a subsidiary, and this often happens with ANCs who you know, appear large because there's a holding company and a lot of subsidiary companies, and it's not, um, it's not uncommon for those companies to use the resources of a related subsidiary or affiliate or what they call sister companies. And this has come up to be a, a hiccup in a, num a number of evaluations because the agency will see, you know, will try to figure out whether that sister company, like a subcontractor, will actually be responsible for performing the work, what kind of resources, and what are the commitment that um, that particular sister company or holding company will have to the offeror. And um, it's not usual to do teaming agreements in this situation, but uh, offer, you know, a commitment by a sister company or a subsidiary is very helpful in that regard. Um, I'm in a protest now actually where a contracting officer um, did not uh, allow a sister company reference to be involved in the past performance uh, uh, evaluation because the contracting officer believed that that sister company combined with the resources of the R4 made the R4 really other than small. He did not realize, of course, that ANCs um, have uh, exemptions from affiliations. So it, it is a more complex issue, although it should be allowed as long as the parameters are clear and there is a, a, a better explanation about exactly how the sister company resources will play into contract performance. On the other hand, uh, particularly with small businesses, set-asides and mentor protege joint ventures and joint ventures, there is a rule now that says that the contracting officer should consider the past performance of the members because as we all know, joint ventures are often created for a particular opportunity um, or you know, a particular series of procurements and as such, as an entity by itself doesn't have past performance. But since the joint venture is really an unpopulated joint venture, it itself will not have employees, rather the work will be performed by the employees of the members and agency should consider the past performance of the members in evaluating the past performance of a joint venture offeror. Again, though, with regard to that past performance evaluation, um, the agency does have discretion and typically should only evaluate the past performance of the members that is comparable to the tasks that particular member will perform under the um, current contract. Next uh, slide. Following a uh, uh, finally, proposal evaluation for pricing or estimated costs. Many offerors do not re realize that when the government says they're going to um, identify the quote unquote reasonableness, of, and that's usually used with proposed pricing, what that means is a legal matter is whether or not the price is too high, not whether it's too low. And typically you don't need to establish reasonableness where there's going to be competition. The FAR actually says that adequate competition generally establishes price reasonableness. So that is not a high bar in a fixed price or otherwise priced um, uh, bid. Often you will see something called determining whether or not a price is realistic or uh, a cost, estimated costs are realistic. And that means that the price or cost um, isn't too low. 
and realism involves the, an agency determining a, a number of things. Uh, one is the main thing is whether the pricing or estimated costs are sufficient to ensure that the technical approach can actually be implemented without substantial risk. So in this in this context, a realism really is whether um, an offeror is proposed an approach that it can actually carry out with the pricing that it has proposed. And that often comes up in staffing contracts where there'll be a fixed price, but an offeror will say, I'm the incumbent, I know what these people cost. You can't arrive at that price without slashing wages. And then to the extent that the awardee is claimed they're gonna use incumbent personnel, they're not gonna be hired those personnel. So therefore they couldn't have gotten that high score or their proposing price was not realistic. Also, uh, return on, uh, rely on external sources with uh, labor rates and, and things like that. Um, I see some proposals where an offeror will refer to their internal you know, cross-referencing and studies. And I don't think that's as persuasive as looking to external industry sources or other, um, other touch points for showing that your labor rates um, are indeed realistic to um, retain or recruit the personnel that you need to do the work. Next slide. So here are my recommendations. Some of them I think are, are fairly obvious, but I would have somebody independently review the proposal's compliance with sort of the technicalities. If that same person is involved in reviewing in a red team review, for example, the substance, it's so easy to overlook the technicalities. So for example, when I am doing a protest, I generally have an associate go through and look at a proposal for these issues. I will look at it for content and look at, um, at whether or not an agency has evaluated the content fairly in, in the context of the evaluation factors, but I have somebody else independently look at the page numbers, measure the margins, look at the graphs, et cetera, to ensure that all those little details um, have been accomplished successfully. I also think that in most instances, it you really do get your money's worth with proposal preparation professionals. Um, among protest lawyers, we, we often joke to say, well, you always can tell which is the winning proposal by putting both volumes on each of your hands and the one that's more weighty and, and substantive or looks more professional is the one that's gonna win. Now that shouldn't be the case, right? It should be the content, but appearances matter. And um, the way uh, that things are drafted, for example, I think I talked to one contractor and they found, uh, the proposal professional found that drafting a narrative in columns rather than you know straight paragraphs is um, much easier and visual to a reader and so they did it that way um, and again these proposals are dense and um, tedious even for me in a protest context so anything that makes it um, more sophisticated more visual more graphic um, is going to be more successful in getting the message across as I mentioned, your technical approach should not only say I'm gonna do it, but how you're gonna do it. And of course, also say you are gonna do it. Um, you could describe something and the agency may not be able to interpret about whether or not that's what you're gonna actually do. So it really has gotta be both. Um, the past performance, you know, there are different ways to argue it, but the subcontractor or joint venture member performance should match the task for which they will be responsible. Internal assessment aren't as good as references to outside sources for price realism. And I have actually participated in red team, gold team reviews. Uh, we just have a different perspective. Uh, as I said, there are certain things I've seen in a number of proposals that have caused problems. Um, I also know um, in a lot of ways what, um, what a better delivery is of certain information. You know, most uh, of the protests I'm involved with are professional services. And, you know, for, for a good part, they all say the same thing. I mean, you can't be all that innovative 
in providing personnel or support to the government. So there is a value to, to having a lawyer participate. However, if you're going to use that lawyer for a protest later on, um, the lawyer has to ensure, and, and you should not solicit the lawyer's participation in something called competitive decision-making, because that means the lawyer cannot um, get access to the protest under something called a protective order, which allows them to look at the opponent's uh, proposal and um, participate in the protest uh, arguments regarding the agency's evaluation of that proposal. So there is some value, but there's some caution there as well. So hopefully you have my number and that you at least uh, are able to walk away here with one thing you didn't know before. And uh, if you have questions, of course, uh, feel free to reach out. Thanks. Thank you, Devin, for a great presentation and sharing your time with us. And thank you to everyone who joined us. The recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Please join us this Friday as we cover each part of the FAR and join us next Wednesday for more hot topics in federal contracting.